voice of the big British castle. It is the top of the hour. Ooh, that's wonderful. I got so bored with the last hour. I'm glad it's gone. Now here's the new one. It's exciting and it's new. How do you do? So wait, is he, does he want to be the, is he running for governor, mayor, or president? He's it, got make up his mind, doesn't he? It's hard to tell. We've got photos of the artists we play here on our sheet that our producer James has given us. And the photo of James Brown looks like one of his arrest photos. Yeah, that's one of his arrest photos. He doesn't look in very good shape, does he? <laughs> <laughs> he looks haggard and tired. His um, ma- manifesto is a little confused, though. Mm, mm. I mean, fair enough. You've got to get over before you go under. That's absolutely fine. Mm. That's a good platform to stand on. But um, got to save your money like the mob. Is that a good thing to be telling the voters? Well, you know, the government, they're just a legitimate mob, aren't they? Right. So it's the same thing, really. He's just being upfront about it. Yeah, being uh, honest. Would you vote for him? Yes. Especially with that with that picture as well? Yes, <laughs> definitely with the picture. <laughs> hey, good morning, listeners. Uh, we're Adam and Joe. I'm Joe. I'm Adam. And welcome to Britain's top political phone-in show. For the next three hours, your chance to let off steam over the issues of the day. Gordon Brown, can we still trust him? Mm. Why can't he be straight with the country? Alistair Darling, can Britain really spend its way out of recession? Alex Salmond, thanks for sending us down the river! Swine flu, mass pandemic or mass panic? Absolutely. All the issues of the day for the next three hours. Your plus, chance to let off some steam! Plus the Millennium <laughs> Dome. What are we doing with this white elephant? White elephant? Or elephant. <laughs> or actual elephant. So get in, let off some steam, get angry. That's what we want. It's, it's, not, it, it's, it's not, it's not. What, isn't it's it? Not, no, it's not a political phone-in show. I thought it was. I thought you were saying it was. I thought that was the whole point mm. of what you were saying was that part of our rebrand. Gordon Brown. Yeah. That's all. Go on. G- Gordon Brown. That's all. You just have to say it like that. <laughs> you just have to phone in and G- say. Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown. Yeah, that's what it's going to be like. Slime flu. Three hours of that. Not No music. Just phone in <laughs> every now and again. We don't even have adverts as well. It's just going to be angry people on the Hardcore phone. Hardcore ranting. Hardcore ranting. Remember, remember, the 5th of September. Now it's no longer so hot. Because I thought, you know, they've got one for the 5th of November. Yes. yes. Remember, remember the and 5th of November. And it's cooling down. Gunpowder, treason and plot. That's right? good, man. Well done. I've got, a, I've got some other ones for, for, like, the other 5ths of the months as well. 5th of June. Do you want to hear yeah, it? Yes. Remember, baboon, it's the 5th of June soon. Probably it will be quite hot. Yeah. The thing you're missing is that... What? I think the November the 5th one was because it was... Uh, Gunpowder, treason and plot. Yeah, fi- fi- fireworks night. Yeah, so I've got the rhyme. Yeah, but there was an event for the rhyme to commemorate. It Probably it will be was hot. There, was there something baboon related on the 5th of June? That was mainly for the rhyme. <laughs> right. But it's aimed at baboons. All right, how about this? 5th of March. Remember the larch on the 5th day of March. The tree has been growing a lot. Now that's touching. That's very sweet. Well, it's poetic, isn't it? Yes, it is poetic. Remember the it? larch. Because people tend to forget about the larch in March. You know, they're still mm. excited about... They're getting over Christmas and the New Year festivities and stuff, and, they, and they're still adjusting to the New Year. Do you want for there. December? What rhymes with December? Remember, remember, the 5th of December. Oh. Soon there'll be presents and cake tot. <laughs> tot! Like a tot of whiskey. Uh, here's some Florence and the Machine. This is Drumming Song. There you go. That's Florence and the Machine with Drumming Song. She's been nominated for a Mercury Prize, is that right? And her machine. Yeah. Uh, she's, a lo- she's a Camberwell girl, local she? to me. Sarah Flandon girl. Mm. Yeah. Do you ever see her walking around with a the machine? A lot of the time. A lot of the time. Do you prefer her or the machine? Um, I don't know. She would, you know, I saw her on a phone. Fo- I heard her on a phone in the other day. It was on Radio 1. Mm. And the DJ, I think it was Joe Wiley, had questions from other Radio 1 DJs to ask her. Uh, and she had a question from Chris Moyles. And the question was, what is the machine? And, nice uh, well, I know. Me and Moyles. <laughs> and Florence just went, well, is that it? Is that his question? It's not very original, is it? What? She speaks like a bloke. So that's a very roundabout way of dissing me. And Moyles, yeah. And Lumping you in the same bag as Moyles, which is a good bag. It's a very popular bag. It's a successful bag. Millions of listeners. Yeah. But it's it's also stained. It's a little cramped in and the bag. Yeah. 
but I it's don't got mind. Some holes in it. I like it there. Yeah. All right. I think that's a funny question. No, she. Don't, I don't think she knows what the machine is. Yeah. Yeah. People have got some issues with some of my questions for Tom York that were on the blog. Yes. I noticed a couple of comments there saying, Adam Buxton, I mean, it was a sort of a backhanded compliment. Mm. Adam Buxton gets a lot out of a lot of lame material, mm. said someone. Like the comedy scientists on the blog. Well, look at the material. I've run the material you through you, the You uh, can't start being, uh, you can't start feeling vulnerable about, like, blog comments. I'm not vulnerable about it. I just thought, am I, is my material being judged now? I mean, that's... A little bit vulnerable. Well... <laughs> my material's brilliant what are you talking about you don't know who posted that it could be a two-year-old it's like taking advice from graffiti on walls yeah uh, graffiti on walls is usually i was rough, just surprised though. it just seemed like if they were going to start thinking about the material I think after the they listened they to our show <laughs> it was a flattering point it was yeah. saying that you know what you do lame material but then you make it really charming by just, being vulnerable just the idea that it's actual material yeah <laughs> is amusing to me yeah. that anyone thinks that you or i come up with and i'm lumping you in with Thanks this as lot. well because let me tell you my material makes your material look like tissue i'm dressed in material with- that's how much material I've got. My clothes are made out of it. Yeah, but look at my material. I Actually, sleep under material. I'm just looking at my material right now, my green jacket. It's a jacket. little frayed. It's totally frayed. It's got <laughs> huge holes in it. In every respect, my material is coming apart. So listen, we're neglecting Black yeah. Squadron a little bit, aren't we? We are a bit. To be perfectly honest, Black Squadron, your commanders are confused after their winter break, summer break. See? They don't even know what season it is. Yeah. Uh, you had an idea, though. I like, I like the, uh, why don't you just go for the simple go one? Go for the simple yeah, command. Yeah, sure. All right. Well, we need to play a record after the command. They're a simple squadron. All right, let me tell you about the record we're going to play. It's a, a free play of mine. It's Spoon. It's uh, one of the first Spoon tracks that I ever heard, and I love it. It's called That's the Way We Get By. But first, here is the command for Black Squadron. Do we need to boot them up, stand them to attention with the intro jingle? Here it is. Black Squadron! the beginning of the show black squadron don't want to miss a thing that's not the way black squadron rolls went to bed at a reasonable hour gotta be sharp on saturday morning that's the secret of the squadron's power black squadron yeah black squadron stand by for your command if you're alone this might not work, but if you're with somebody else, then the moment I say this word, you have to do it to the person you're with. Ready? Ready. Tickle! That's uh, Orange Juice, and that, we think, is a session version, uh, because we've both got that album, haven't we, Adam? Poor old soul, yeah, that's like the, the version that I'm familiar with is more laid back, and mm. uh, it's got more of a groove on it. But that's a good one as well. Lovely bit of orange juice. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I wonder if Black Squadron are tickling each other. Do you think it's like a kids' show? This uh, it's basically like a toddler's oh, program, Saturday morning. It? But tickling isn't necessarily a childish thing. It can be dangerous. That's right. I mean, if you were driving in a car there and someone started tickling you on the command of this show, that was absolutely lethal. It could have been fatal. So what are you saying? So I'm saying that's not for kids, is it? Death. Oh, I see. They can't handle it. You're saying that if it were, if a commando was to do it, it's a very yes. different kettle of cards. Exactly. Tickling is something that uh, real squaddies are trained to do. You can uh, disarm a terrorist with a carefully placed tickle. Absolutely you can. Tickle them in the right place and they're forced to drop the gun you and know, chortle I, with joy. I wouldn't be surprised, on a serious note, if they used um, tickling in places like Guantanamo. As a torture? Yeah. Tick- well, that's different. That's Tickle dark. torture. That's dark. I'm saying this is a serious I mean, when- show, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. You're right. When you're a child and someone's tick- someone tickles you and then doesn't stop, yeah. you can nearly suffocate. It's awful. It's horrible. But um, I'd like to see in a Bond film, James Bond work his way through a room of baddies just with carefully placed tickling. A nice bit of tickling. Don't you think? You know, where's the best place to tickle someone? Because the obvious thing is to go for under the armpits there. The ribs. It's the, the ribs, side. I think. You reckon? A, a very sudden, you launch a hand suddenly towards the ribs. Yeah. And that's guaranteed have to get you any never, party started. Have you never tried um, doing the thigh tickle? Mm, the thigh pinch is effective. The inner thigh. Go in for the inner thigh and really root around in the inner thigh there. What? Well, you have to do that with someone you're intimate with. Yeah. Do you? Who are you doing that to? I don't know anyone, really. Did you do that to Tom York? Get a big reaction out of... You know, I haven't done it to Tom York. I, I did, but we I did... tickle celebrities. Well, I did. That could be our new thing. I did tickle Johnny Greenwood from Radio. Did you? <laughs> I tickled him on his buttocks. Did you? I reached around and I grabbed his... Uh, He's probably working on a song about that. I grabbed his buttocks and I, I did a little tickle and he looked appalled. Mm. 
I mean, I really regretted doing it. Did you? Yeah. Why did you do it? Because I was overexcited. Really? Yeah. Was he in a happy mood or was he... He was. He seemed to be in a happy mood, which is why I thought maybe it would be a good thing to do. I think the misconception is that tickling someone can make an unhappy person happy. That is true. It doesn't, it? doesn't work that way. It makes them angry. But listen, under normal circumstances, uh, tickling the buttocks is very... gets good results. If you come anywhere near my buttocks... Well, I, I would, will be so You're a happy. good example of a person I wouldn't <laughs> feel comfortable doing it with. <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> it wouldn't occur to There's me. There's a lot to tickle to here. Tickle you. There's a whole lot of tickling. That's what confuses people. They don't know where to start. Right. Yeah. Where There's, would you like to There's be miles of me. I mean, no one likes, no one really likes being tickled, do they? And my daughter, I've noticed, my young daughter absolutely it's loves tickled. it. And I, little I, babies love being tickled, though. Not my daughter. She's really? She's fed up with it, yeah. Really? She looks at me with a look of utter Get disgust. off! What are you doing? Ah! Get off! That's the only word she can say. She can't... <laughs> In that very low voice <laughs> as well. Go on, get off! Like that. It's tickling. Quite, quite yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, um, I just said, hey, listen, uh, <laughs> as if I had it's good. something to say. Uh, we're going to play some hockey right now. What's hockey, James? Is this... I haven't read our sheets. Is it? Okay, he's going to tell us about it. This is Song Away. Uh, hockey. They're from Portland, Oregon in, in the United States. Portland is the hot new town, right? I mean, mm. that's it used to be Austin, Texas for a while, and Austin may still be hot, but Portland is now absolutely where it's at. So Have you ever I'm, been uh, there? No, never been. Ever been to Austin, Texas? No, would love to go. Would love to. I've been there. Have you? What's yes. it like? It was very nice. Yeah. Yeah, the Which Alamo Draft House cinemas there. That's all I cared about. Full of cowboys. Full of cowboys. Cinema for cowboys. Yeah, did you wear your cowboy boots then? Yes. Have a pistol fight? Do you think they're good then, hockey? Did you enjoy that? I asked you if you had a pistol fight. <laughs> no, it's a cinema. <laughs> <laughs> I had some food and watched a film. You were a little grumpy about hockey, <laughs> I thought. Well, I think it's puffing, mysterious puffing how, in corner. how new bands appear on stations like this, you yeah. know? Who, who chooses these new bands? Who chooses which one to push? I don't know. The you guy, know what I mean? There's some guy who listens to all the music. They sounded a in. tiny bit undistinguished, I thought. Really? Yeah. Bit I mean, that's a controversial thing to have an opinion, I know. A bit workmanlike. Bit, yeah, tiny bit. I mean, maybe I need to listen to them more. Well, they were very much but in the why thrall them? of... I mean, there must um, be millions of exciting new bands. Why Why hockey? I mean, they look cool. They're oh. good. we got a picture of them. They're young and good-looking, stripy shirts. You've answered your own question then, haven't you? Young and good-looking with stripy shirts. Yeah, <laughs> that's all you need. <laughs> and they sound nice. I thought that was nice. It was nice. You're right to be positive about it. Yeah, I thought that was I nice. Was rubbish. Oh, come on. I thought it was nice. It was really nice. Was you know good. what? I was uh, doing a bit of name-dropping there before and um, about uh, tickling Johnny Greenwood's beautiful. Yes. Because I was at Reading last weekend, right? Right. I saw Red uh, Radiohead in full swing. I mean, that was... I think that's going to go down in the annals of history mm. as being one of the all-time great shows at Reading or any other festival. But I met lots of groovy young bands, bumped into Vampire Weekend. Mm. Very nice boys. Uh, so you're worried you might bump into hockey and they might have heard well, that. Well, this is what I'm building up to, yeah. Yeah. Because when I do, I'm going to be able to say, listen, that wasn't me, that was uh, Tall Joe Cornballs. Yeah. Uh, so don't punch me in the face, Hockey. Yeah. Because I also bumped into Gold and Silver's drummer. We've played them on the yeah, show. Yeah, we like before. them, though. They're fantastic. We've been very positive about them. Uh, so, you know, when I, if and when I bump into Hockey, I don't mm. want any aggravation. Mm. I don't want a mm. Hockey puck right in my, <laughs> upside my head, <laughs> is what I'm saying, okay? I'm so, looking forward to having a fight with Hockey. Really? Yeah. I no. mean, I, there's only one guy that looks a bit tasty in Hockey. Which one's that second from the right? No, the guy on the end with the little mustachio. <laughs> <laughs> he looks overly tasty. He looks heavily flavoured. The rest of hockey aren't going to give you much trouble, I don't I think. I know, second from the right looks like it's trouble. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. It's 9.30, time for the news. Stand down, your work is done. You've earned yourself a nice warm bath. And maybe a nice little bun. Very nice. That's Radiohead, of course, with no surprises. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music, and uh, we won't go on about Radiohead anymore. Suffice to say that it was a wonderful show uh, at Reading last weekend. Well, thanks also to everyone who came along to my show that I did there. Many Black Squadron members came along, and uh, there was a very loud bit of Stevenage before I went on, which mystified the, um, the MC... He'd never heard of Stephen or our show. <laughs> and when various members of the crowd started shouting, Stephen, he said uh, he was confused. He didn't know what the hell was going on. He said, what's Stephen? What happens if I shout Stephen? And they said, go on, shout Stephen. So the MC finally shouted Stephen and there was a very loud, just coming. And if you don't know what that means, listeners, 
then let me explain. That's just something that you can shout if you want to identify other people that listen to this show. Uh, if you shout Stephen in a crowded place and someone shouts just coming back at you, then you know that they are also listeners to this programme. I got a couple of shouts in the street during the week. Oh, yeah? On Oxford Street. Did you respond? Uh, well, you know, I was walking down a very crowded Oxford Street. Yeah. And from somewhere in the crowd came, Stephen! And it was a bit like a sort of a 50s horror film. Uh-huh. I didn't know where it had come from or who'd <laughs> said it. When I looked round, all I could see were blank faces. Yeah. So I was too confused. I missed the moment. You, you see, you shouldn't look around even. It should just, just immediately be... come out. Yeah, just coming! And another one I got uh, in... I was walking through Soho and, and a young man walked past me and went, Ah, Steven! Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was again so surprised. I think I went, hey, or hi, possibly, at best. But I'm no good at it. You are not I can't respond it. to it. Listen, I was in an airport toilet. Really? And there was a Stephen from inside the cubicle. Really? Next to mine. From inside the urinal. <laughs> no, in a cubicle. I could, wow. couldn't even see where it had come from. I just heard from within the cubicle. I was washing my hands. I hear, Stephen? <laughs> <laughs> so i gave him a just coming you know but it was pretty weird for me and everyone else in the mm. lavatory at the time they just thought wow this is a special new type of cottaging that's going on <laughs> in the airport <laughs> i'll be back later anyway i've um, got to practice we've got to figure out some way that i can get up to speed you know sharpen up my Stephen responses you really do a sort of a training camp Stephen, let you see can't even do it on air try again try again try Stephen. Again. <laughs> You know, just, just, just coming. Coming is fine. If, if you're embarrassed about the just coming, you just keep coming. Something like that. Coming. Uh-huh. <laughs> Can't do it. Last bit of Radiohead related nonsense. Don't forget that there is a so-called interview with myself and Tom York uh, available to see, exclusive to our BBC Six Music blog. You can check that out right now. The blog can be found at bbc.co.uk slash blogs slash Adam and Joe. And don't forget you can just email us about general bits and bobs. The blog tends to be targeted comments, doesn't it? Arranged under themes, uh-huh. you know. But if you've just got general wiffle waffle that you want to send our way, then the email address is adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. You know, we love your emails. Made-up jokes and stuff. We might have a few made-up jokes that we've accumulated over the summer Maybe. later in the show. And you can text us, of course, at any point on 64046. And text will be charged at your standard message rate. You know, Zane Lowe says all that stuff incredibly fast when he's on his show. He's a good DJ. But I wonder if he might get a knuckle rap because he says it so fast. You know what I mean? No, that's allowed, isn't it? Because they say that stuff very fast at the end of mortgage adverts on the radio. If you go too fast, though, it becomes incomprehensible. Yeah. I mean, he's, he does it like as a thing. He does it amazingly. He's an information machine, though, isn't he? Yeah. He's a a, a walking encyclopedia of useless rock trivia. Yeah. And, and, rock and trivs. useful rock trivs. Yeah. And very useful rock trivs. Mm. <laughs> he was wandering around at Reading as well. He's a nice guy. He's a very nice guy. Anyway, uh, here's Friendly Fires with Kiss of Life. That was Friendly Fires there with Kiss of Life. Now, they're one of four bands presenting shows for Six Music on Sunday afternoons in the run-up to the Mercury Music Prize, right? Mm. That's the big event in the music calendar around this time of year amongst all the other big events in the music calendar, right? Wouldn't you say, Joe? Yeah, yeah, I would say that. (laughs) Uh, The Horrors are actually presenting the first of the shows tomorrow afternoon from 3.30. What's that going to be like? Yeah? I mean, can they speak? They, um, they're like vampire people, though. They stay up for four or five days on the trot, and uh, I wouldn't think that they would be in any way articulate. They're quite posh, the horrors. Are they? Yeah, they are. Like posh vampires? Yeah, they're very, very posh vampires. <laughs> so I think they, they're very well spoken, <laughs> yeah. probably. I'm, I like the horrors. I'm going to drink your blood. I like the one with the extended pudding bowl haircut. You yeah. know what I mean? It's brave to have a pudding bowl, but then to let the fringe actually descend beneath the nose. <laughs> <laughs> That's really going out on a limb. I like it. Yeah. Well, tune in tomorrow at 3.30 and you'll be able to hear how they get on here at Six Music. Now, I took um, one of the other people that was lurking around at Reading, right, mm. was um, Daniel Radcliffe and uh, Rupert Grind. Mm. Uh, Harry Pooter and um, his buddy um, Ron Johns. Ron Weasley. Yeah. They were wandering around there and they were sort of disguised. They had crazy hats and stuff on and goggles and things like that. Stop them from being mobbed by muggles. 
Uh, yeah, but they, I mean, it didn't really, because the muggles were absolutely swamping mm. them mm. and taking pictures. They were really nice, though. They seemed, everyone, you know, they were very smiley and up for having their pictures taken and stuff like that. I like them both. I've especially got a soft spot for Grinty. Yeah, do you? Yeah, I think he's Malcolm McDowell for the noughties. Yeah. Do you think he's got a, uh, do you think he's got the longevity there? Is he going to last? Well, it depends on his career choices. He could either be M Malcolm McDowell or he could be the guy from Confessions of a Window Cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> he could go either way. Yeah. His choices so far, Thunderpants. That and was very young, though. He was it very was very young. young. And he did a driving school one. It's early days for both of them. Very early They're days. They're very young. Let's, was, let's not judge them. There was a very snippy interview with him in, in some men's with Grinty. Mag. Yeah, in FHM or something like that. Really? Where they were basically, the whole thrust of the thing was like, you're washed up, you're, ne you're never going to have a what? career. And they were really giving him a hard time about it. Um, I thought he dealt with it very manfully in the article. Mm, mm. I wish him all the best. Anyway, we went to see Harry Potter and the half blued plants. Oh, did you? Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Me and my boys, they were absolutely desperate to see it, even though they're pretty young. I mean, five and seven, mm. you know, and it's a 12. Uh, mm. So it was up to me as the parent to make the call. And um, I was a little bit worried it would be too scary. Actually, it wasn't too scary. What it was, was too boring. Mm, it's long, isn't <laughs> it's it? How really long is it? really long. It's two, two and a quarter it's hours? two and a half years. It's two and a half really? hours. Two and a half mm -hmm. hours. I mean, I would be bored in any film that lasted that long. You know what I mean? And the thing is that they've... It's David Yates, is it, the director? Yes. He's got a lot of character work going on in there. And they are really... I mean... Hooray, there's some great character development. But that's a little bit lost on the under 10s. Um, and, and my own fault for taking them. You know, it is a 12A, certainly. Uh, perhaps the 12-year-olds. What was happening? What were your kids doing? How did they, well, uh, just, you know, show their boredom? It started off uh, very early on <laughs> with uh, with one of them getting some popcorn lodged in his throat. Ah. Which happens quite a lot. I forgot that it happened last time. I've just got to stop buying them popcorn. But about 10 minutes in, right, there was a tap on my shoulder. Ah! So I was like, okay, have some, here, drink a little bit of, uh, no Heimlich. fizzy pop. No, because it was just, it was, you know, do you ever get that? It's a little shard of popcorn and you can feel I it. I don't stuck really like there. popcorn. Don't have it. Right. Well, that's a good reason not to, because very often you can get a little shard lodged mm, there mm, mm. and you can feel it. I much prefer to eat shards. Do you? Mm, Big bag Cadbury of shards. shards. <laughs> Delicious. Chocolate Razor covered shards. shards. Yeah. Wow. Mm, uh, no, he just goes for the popcorn and the shards come off. And then, um, so right the way through the film, he, he, he was just making like loads of noise as well. In the quiet bits, all you could hear was. <laughs> like, he wasn't choking. He was just trying to dislodge the shard. So I felt bad. I kept on saying, shh, try and do it a little bit more quietly. And I had to buy him a hot dog to see if that would dislodge it and stuff. And did you not? Was he disturbing other viewers? I would say so. You did. You, you should have taken him outside. Well, what was I going to do, though? There was two of them. I didn't want to just totally that's true, that's true. disrupt that's the true. whole thing. I couldn't leave the other guy on his own there, the other guy, my son. <laughs> that other guy. Meanwhile, that little guy that follows me around. Yeah, the weird short guy. Meanwhile, the other guy, right, is bored out of his mind. <laughs> he can't figure out what's going on. The only time he's perking up is when they do the broomstick battles. Uh, what's the sport game called? Quidditch. Quidditch, right? So he perks up a little bit when the Quidditch starts and when there's some extreme um, wand action going on. But apart Apart from that, during all the plot unfolding moments, of which there are many, he was absolutely bored out of his mind. And he was, he turned round and he was facing the wrong way in his seat and he was bashing his head against the back no. of the seat. You and I used to do that <laughs> as a yeah. demonstration of boredom as yeah. teenagers. Well, he was we doing it sincerely. Wow, that's advanced. And I was saying, man, are you, do you want to leave? Because we can leave. We don't, if it's too boring, we can leave. And he's like, no, 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 I like it. I really like it. I really like it. Let's stay. So at two and a half hours of this, we must have been driving the people behind us mental. Was it quite full in there? It was relatively full, yeah. Mm. And in Norwich as well, um, it's a very respectful audience you get. There's no mobile phone calls and talking and stuff. People Ooh. are really nice and well behaved. So, and we were the worst behaved people there, spilling popcorn, coughing and spluttering, bashing heads <laughs> against the back of the seats. It was pretty bad. But we were, we were thinking maybe we might talk about cinema etiquette a little bit later on in the show. Yeah, we might do a text the nation, listeners. Uh, do a cinema manifesto like we did for gigs. Yeah. We only say might, though. 
We might do it. Yeah. Might not do might it. Might not. We don't know. It's like that. We, we make decisions on the spur. That's how we roll. Here's a free choice. This is yours, Joe, right? Yeah, this is another one from uh, Now. Most Deaths album. Ah, well done. Yeah. <laughs> I played a track from this last week. Uh, the album's called The Ecstatic. Uh, this is another of my favourite tracks. Listen to this one, listeners. Listen to where this one goes and where his uh, rapping goes and what happens to the backing track. It's phenomenal. This is called Casa Bay. That's Empire of the Sun, mate. Is it, mate? Yeah, that's Walking on a Dream. Right. If you listen to that song, right? Yeah. There's only about, like, three chords in it. just goes over and over again. Yeah, There's but, no real chorus. Yeah, yeah, but that's a good thing, you know. A lot of bands overuse chords. Listen, mate, I'm not saying it's mate, a bad thing. Look, mate. Why are you getting with, up in mate, my grill about it, what's mate? What's the matter with you today, mate? I'm just saying that they only use a minimal number of chords in the song and it just goes over round and round and round. He's done a lot with a little, that's all I'm saying, and you're getting all up in my grill about it. Mate, you're you're really steamed up today. I'm really steamed up about the way you're behaving towards me. Yeah. Yeah. You've got some issues I'd like to talk and discuss with you about. By the way, mate, where are you from? Oh. Where were you? What country are you from? Canberra. Because your accent's a little America. bit funny. Uh, this is like an Australian, Australian version of Inglorious. We can't say the name of that film, can we? Can't we? Not even if we say Sturds. <laughs> no. It's like an Australian version of that Quentin Tarantino film. <laughs> <laughs> are you, Where are they from in that film? Well, there's a brilliant scene where they all try and suss each other's fake accents. Oh, right. They're all pretending to be uh, charming. Yeah. Is that an enjoyable film? Yeah. Yeah, well done. Um, so listen, l ladies and gentlemen, I think that it's time we launched the nation's favourite feature, don't you? I definitely doodles. Here's the jingle. Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. So one of uh, my favourite little blogs that I like to visit is is called Ultra Culture, run by a young man called Charlie Line. It's a very good opinionated movie blog, and he's done on it uh, this week a manifesto for cinema going. And he makes some quite good points about what gets annoying about cinemas. One of his points is the following. Screens in cinemas should always be 70% as wide as the auditorium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's quite specific with his commands on the blog Ultra Culture. But there he's complaining about, you, you know, you pay money for a cinema and then you get into a room that's smaller than your front room. Yeah. With a screen that's only just larger than your telly. Has that ever happened? Yes, you get filtered off down the sides. It's like you go to a cinema complex and you think, wow, they've got 20 screens here. And you realise that about 10 of them are, yes, as you or say. Or all of them sometimes. Right. Like, they, they used to be a giant screen and then little ones, but the giant screens have become uneconomical. Uh -huh. So they've sliced and diced them up and often they're all really kind of tiny. Plus you get a uh, sound bleeding across from some of the other yes. screens in those things as well so anyway we were going to with your help listeners put uh together a sort of a 10 point cinema manifesto and we're going to take this manifesto and we're going to distribute it to all major cinema chains and if they don't obey the laws yeah. then everyone who listens to this show will boycott those chains yeah it's right? going to be it's it's more of a case less of a case of odeon and more of a case of odeon nice oscar deutsch eat our manifesto nice was his name oscar deutsch yeah oscar deutsch entertains our nation yeah, i think that's what exactly uh, Odeon stood for. Take this, Oscar Deutsch! And maybe that's, maybe that's going too far. Maybe yeah. that's against the big British castle rules. Uh, we can't encourage listeners to boycott any kind of company, but we can mobilise Black Squadron. That's right. I mean, Black Squadron are beneath the radar. They're above the law. What are Black Squadron going to do exactly? <laughs> Something involving toast <laughs> and manifesto. And eggs in their mouth. <laughs> go and tickle Oscar Deutsch. I don't know. They're going to go loaded with all their various bits of Black Squadron equipment. <laughs> They're going to do some hideous subterfuge on cinemas. Anyway, so text us on 6404 Four, six, with things that you'd like fixed about the cinema. Here's one of the things I'd like fixed. I think they should bring back boxes. Mm -hmm. In the old days, boxes in theatres were for very posh people, right? You'd have your own little sort of balcony, yeah. private area. I think they should be soundproofed and glass, and they should put idiots in them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But then the idiots would have to pay extra, wouldn't they? Yeah, but, well, maybe the maybe the idiot boxes, which is what they'd be called, would be cheaper. That's an interesting angle, though. You're you're putting the idiots in the exclusive area. Yeah, so that they're soundproof, so that they can misbehave and text and chat and stuff and moon or puke on the inside of the glass uh -huh. as much as they want. Yeah. They'd be behind the civilised people. <laughs> have you seen much mooning in the cinema recently? <laughs> well, I'm just thinking if you put someone in a glass, 
glass box, they tend to moon. <laughs> Either that or press the boobs up against it. Yeah. It's a natural human response. It's a nice thing, though. They should have a separate box for that. Well, you could turn the other way in your seat. <laughs> like your son. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey, speaking of which, Joe mm. is just checking the um, ratings regulations. Yeah, someone sent us in a little uh, text pertaining to Adam's story about his kids in the cinema. It's from Chris in Sterling. Dear Adam and Joe, sorry to say that the minimum age for a 12A film is eight. Parental discretion only applies to kids aged eight to 12. I didn't know that. The authorities have been informed. We'll be in touch in due course. Flipping heck. So Count Buckley's is going to be clanked up. I'm a lawbreaker taking my kids <laughs> to see films they shouldn't see like Harry Potter it's and the abuse, Mood man. Isn't it? Is it? Yeah, NSPCC. Wow, you really took it to an extreme... Well, you've Place. abused your children's imagination by showing them dragons, scary dragons, at too young an age. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't have any nightmares, though. They just slept very soundly. My, my most treasured cinematic memories are films that hideously traumatised me at a young age. Mm. Yeah. It wasn't hideously traumatic in any way. You know, they were more hideously traumatised by Coraline than they were by the Half-Blood Prince. I tell you what else I'd get rid of in cinema going. Yeah. Uh, pick and mix. Why? And What's the problem pick, with well, that? Well, those pick and mix bags. Right. They're so noisy. They're so big. Uh, they're like sleeves. You have to plunge most of your arm into them to get to the sweets. What do you do? I, I th and they're very crinkly. Right. Cloth bags. Cloth bags. Silky or cloth bags. Hessian sacks. Yeah, that don't make any noise when you go for a sweet. No wrapped sweets. Mm -hmm. No no cellophane. Mm -hmm. All sweets served in cloth bags. Yeah. And, uh, That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. So presumably you've got a big popcorn problem then, haven't you? Uh, with people crunching popcorn? Yeah. Mm, a little bit, I suppose, but it's traditional popcorn. What about slurping of drinks? <laughs> Doesn't bother me, really. No. When you get down to the bottom of the cup, you mean? Hoovering yeah. up the dregs. And people slooshing around their ice. I like slooshing. I mean, it's not a big problem. Not a big problem. What are you eating when you go? Do you take a snack in there? Or do I you... like minstrels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and some water. <laughs> nice bit of water. Yeah. That's nice. I like, um, what are the other ones? But hang on, this is, this is just what do you like. This, it's gotta be, you've gotta give me attitude, opinion. Oh, right. I, I tell like, you what I don't like. Mm, yes. Mm, oh, God, I don't know. Um, phones, mobile phones. Yes, good. Okay. Now, I tell you what I would get rid of, right? The orange ads. I mean, that's a very old... Well, they've uh, got a new one up there now, the they? Juliette Lewis one. Have you seen that one? No. Ah, it's very dense. It's a treat They've store. tried to pack a lot of jokes in. Flipping heck. It makes me want to kill people. I, none of those orange ads is exciting. It was a point very well made in Peep Show, I think, yes. by uh, David Mitchell's character. Like, you can tell the people who haven't been to the cinema for two years because they're the ones laughing at the orange ads. Yes. I watched that film State of Play the other day. Oh, yeah, how was that? It's got the man from the orange ads in it. Has it? Yeah really popped me out of the story <laughs> <laughs> when he walked in <laughs> that guy's a bit um in trouble really anyway we'd like to hear your ideas listeners for what you would have on your cinema manifesto what things you would ban and we can also have like what things you would enforce as well what things yeah you would any enforce. any kind of rules i mean remember our gig manifesto we did and how effective that's been it's totally changed it's the totally gig going changed experience gig going yeah for people mm. <laughs> <laughs> here's a bit of joe strummer for you right now this is coma girl that's uh, Joe Strummer with Coma Girl. This is Adam and Joe Ooh. on BBC Six Music on a Saturday morning. Welcome along, listeners, if you've just joined us. We're very happy to have you listening. You know, what would it be like if no one was listening at all? Just I mean, then we'd seem pretty stupid. Nah, it would be the same, wouldn't it? You're right. It's exactly the same. Yeah. We'd just be sat I'd here. I'd swear more. Would you? Yeah. Do you miss swearing? I do a bit. You like to swear, don't you? I find it useful in expressing myself. I swear less now that I've been doing this show, I think. Do you? Yeah, because I'm more... It's a good I'm, discipline, isn't it? Yeah. Good discipline. We shouldn't for, even talk mm. about it, though, because the dirty words will pop into our heads and then they'll accidentally come out and then mm. there'll be a scandal and then mm. we'll get fired. Then we'll get Saturdays off. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're aiming for, isn't extra, it? Extra half a day off, mate. It's a beautiful day out there, That's mate. That's lovely. You going surfing later? Of course I'm going surfing. Have you waxed your tinny uh, board? Tin yeah. Board? My tinny board's all completely hairless. Yeah. Beautiful. F lovely. What kind of a wave are you hoping for? Uh, one, one of the wavy, wavy curly w ones. Oh, they're my favourite. I, I like to, uh, what I like to do, Adam, yeah, yeah. is I like to surf right out and wait for a big one to come along. <laughs> and then what I do is I, I stand up on my surfboard and I surf down the middle of the wave. Yeah. It, I call it a tube. It resembles a tube. I call it that I too. Yeah, I surf down the middle. Beautiful And then what tube. tends to happen is photographers take photos of me. Right. And, uh, cameramen, 
uh, take uh, camera picture, pictures, pictures, pictures of, of me, moving, and pictures. they put me in documentaries oh, great, about mate. sexy surfers. Now, what I've got a little ca- a little camera mounted on the tip of my board. <laughs> Have you, mate? Yeah. Do you put the footage on YouTube? Yeah, I do. Oh, brilliant. And, and it's super, super fast. It takes like a, about a thousand frames a minute. One time, I was surfing and I fell off my board. Wow! Wow! Wild! What? <laughs> What happened? Nothing. Nothing else. Did got, you get back on? Uh, I did. I, I got. Oh, I, mate! I, no, actually, I paddled. What? I paddled back into the you shore. Paddled? Were you on a had, bike? Had a bit of a sit down. <laughs> it's gone South African. <laughs> had to sit in on the beach, mate. Did you? And you paddled in. You were on a bike. Yep. Did you use a bike? <laughs> no, I was on a surfboard, mate. You said you paddled. Where are you from? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, let's focus. You were going to tell us something about... Uh, I feel the moment's passed. I, I, do you? I might save it. Do another record. You're going to do a free play right now. My friend Danny uh, made me a compilation this summer, and I haven't had a compilation made for me for a very long time. Mm. And Danny really puts the work in. He does. He's one of these people that does the cover art, Yes, and he d- lays it what out. What was the cover art on this one? Uh, it was Did he do quite serious cover art, or yeah, was it he a bit of, of a joke? He, no, 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 he's, it's pretty serious. Like, he'd sourced pictures of all the featured artists right. and made a little compilation. Right, like a Now Netflix. That's What I Call Music. Kind of thing, yeah. Compilation. And uh, it was beautifully laid out, lovely mm. track listing and everything. And he'd really put some... Label on the CD? Sure. Really? Printed, printed label? Printed label. <laughs> because that can let a compilation down. You do a beautiful sleeve, then you open it, and it's just uh, sharpie on the, no, on no, no. the CD. Direct printing onto the CD surface. Wow. Himself. I mean, it was just exemplary. He's from a family of printers. He is, yeah, mm. that's true. So, you know, he's got a little head start. But it was wonderful. And it was one of those tracks, we, we played the compilation one evening when we were on holiday, and we played it from start to finish, and it was just a very coherent, enjoyable musical journey. Mm. Mm. A few things that I already knew, but they were nice because I was sort of rediscovering them. Hadn't heard them for a long time, it was nice to hear them again. And then a couple of nuggets that I'd never heard before, which were wonderful. Sat very well. It was You're like sounding a, a bit like show. Zane Lowe there. Yeah. When you said comprehensive musical journey, <laughs> a little bit of your Australian accent was still in there. Ah, oh, yeah. Spatchcock. Anyway, this was a track that I hadn't heard before by Kevin Ayres that popped up on Danny's compilation. And it's quite odd, um, but it's enjoyable. I hope you like it, listeners. This is Town Feeling. Eels with Hey Man, now you're what? Really living. Ah, there we go. This is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music. <laughs> when are you laughing at me going, ah, there we go. Eels with Hey Man, now you're a little what? <laughs> Just sounded comically dufferish. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so listen, do you, Adam Buxton, do you watch a lot of BBC Three? You know what? I don't anymore. What? I feel as if it's no longer my target. Because they rejected your pilot? No, that's not the reason! <laughs> <laughs> well, they have some problems with their comedy output, uh, BBC Three, maybe. Some people might say, you know, uh, problems the wrong word, controversy, right. horn, and, horn and cord and stuff like that, you know. It does very well, though. It does very well, but some people are angry about it. But I tell you what they do very well mm-hmm. is youth documentaries. Oh, yes. They do really good youth documentaries that go on for hours. Like, there was one, uh, something called Man or Chicken or something, testing the prowess of young men. That went on for, it seemed to go on in sort of two hour segments. But because there's no commercial breaks, uh, they can do really satisfying sort of teen documentaries. And they seem to have a thing going. I think they might be working in consort with the government. They seem to be making a documentary about every single teenager in Britain. Uh-huh. One by one, going through the entire <laughs> populace and kind of f- trying to fix them. Yeah. They're starting with the most idiotic ones. I think Channel 4 might have started this, actually, and BBC Three have now taken over the kind of task. Well, the classic in the genre was the Chris Needham one years ago. Wasn't yes. It? In What was that one? In Bed With My Dinner? Uh, no? No, that's Bob Mills. Um, what was it about? Uh, you know the one I'm talking about, though? The guy, in bed with, the, guy uh, the Madonna fan. Or was that years and years ago? Oh, anyway, keep talking. Different. Anyway, the Chris Needham one was the heavy metal guy. Right. Do you remember that one? Yeah, it was called something. It was oh, a, the, the title was a riff on In Bed With Madonna. They d- that was a follow-up one, In Bed was With it? Chris Needham. Right. Uh, but the original one, anyway. I love that kind of thing. Yeah. I love a documentary about a really endearingly thick teenager uh-huh. who kind of has to come face-to-face with their problems. There was another one on BBC Three called... Uh, uh, oh, God, I can't remember any of the names, but people who were, like, addicted to junk food and they were taken to see the junk food manufactured, yeah. uh, who were, like, addicted to label clothing and they were taken to Indonesia to see the sweatshops where the clothing was made, ah. stuff like that. Anyway, there was one on the other day called Young, Dumb and Living Off Mum. Uh-huh. 
and they took a group of teenagers uh, who were particularly dumb yeah. and dependent on their parents, stuck them in a big house and gave them tasks. And the winner was going to be the one that was the most adult, who'd grown up the most by the end. And how long were they in there for? Weeks and weeks and weeks. Weeks and weeks and weeks. Yeah, but every episode was about an hour and a half, and it was very satisfying. No commercial breaks. You could get really absorbed so it's in like their a trials. Big Brother. Yeah, it was extraordinary. And they came across an amazing girl aged about 18, called Danielle, uh -huh. who looked like sort of the ghost of a young Vanessa Feltz. <laughs> She'd done her face up to look really weirdly pale. Yeah. And uh, like she it. had huge blonde hair, and she was very, very ditzy, mm. but in a really entertaining and kind of charming way. One of the tasks she was given was to go into a primary school, teach the kids a history lesson, and then perform a play based on that history lesson Whoa. at the end of the day to the students and pupils. So um, the subject Danielle chose to do the play on was the tragic death of Princess Diana. Nice subject. Now, she was 18, so she was must have been about five or six when that actually happened, uh, the terrible tragedy. So she can be excused for not knowing too many of the details of what happened, right? Yeah. But she did some online research to back up her facts. But despite her online research, she still got some of the, you know, hard, cold truths of Diana's accident a bit wrong. Here's, here's a clip of her... Uh, a little bit of one of her lessons. Listen to this. Right. How did Princess Diana tragically die? Yeah? She crashed into the Eiffel Tower. Her car crashed into yeah, the Eiffel Tower. That is correct. Well done. <laughs> It would have been better, don't you think, if she'd crashed right into the Eiffel Tower? And the, the top had just toppled down. And I mean, not better in any other way, but, you know, more. No. Yeah. It, yeah. More prosaic, uh, less... Pro oh, dear. So she gets a bit embarrassed about that. A teacher intercedes and tries to correct the facts. Yeah. Uh, and listen to Danielle kind of trying to come to terms emotionally with the impact that the crash must have had on, you know, Diana's family. Listen to this bit. That must have, like... That must have, like, hit her son bad, mustn't it? Whoa. I mean, that is... If you're taking the temperature of the nation's youth, that's a pretty savage indictment. <laughs> Can we just hear that one more time? That must have, like... That must have, like, hit her son bad, mustn't it? Bad one. Manit, 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 manit. Who's she talking? Her, hit her son bad. Hit her, yeah, had a terrible impact on her children. Right. Is what she's saying. Must have hit her son but bad. But that's manit. okay. You know, she's um, emotionally engaging with it. Then, so then she that's kind right. of maybe she was rendered inarticulate by the well, exactly, emotion. Yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. So she corrals the kids together. They start rehearsing their play about the death of Diana, mm. and there's still a couple of factual inaccuracies. This is the kids uh, going through the cast list. This is them describing who's in the car when the crash happens. Welcome to the Princess Diana show. Princess Diana died in a tragic car accident by a murderer. This is um, the car driver for Princess Diana. This is Diana's husband. This is the murderer. <laughs> So Prince Charles is in the car, yeah, and also the murderer is in the car. <laughs> I mean, this is a good idea for a, a, a series in itself, though, isn't it? Just Murdering. getting just getting children to do uh, half remembered versions of yes. history. Well, I always thought the news would be better staged by kids, yeah, just generally. But that's, you know, little kids, they've got a really positive attitude to murder. Yeah, that murder. murder. Well, it's exciting. They it love all that stuff. They love war killing. and the army and all that kind of miserable so stuff. So you would have thought someone might have uh, interceded there and explained to Danielle that, you know, the whole murder thing is a pretty unsubstantiated conspiracy theory that's probably not true. And even if it was true, it's doubtful the murderer would actually be sitting in the car and also that Charles wasn't in the car, etc., and they didn't crash into the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so here's the final performance of the Diana show. Uh, this is the finished play. I think BBC Three might have c cut around this a little for taste and decency purposes. <laughs> no. But when all the kids giggle, what's happening on screen is they're performing the crash. OK, that's just a little note. But here's the finished uh, production of Danielle's Diana show. Wow. Welcome to the Princess Diana show. Princess Diana gets into the car. Hurry up, I'm going to be late! Princess Diana is dead. The end. <laughs>
<laughs> I mean, it's, it's that's how I remember it. It's sort of amazing, though, isn't it? That just over ten years later, that kind of thing is uh, being screened. Though, well, it's it? a terrifying sort of warning of how factual inaccuracy can very quickly become dangerous historical revisionism. That's true, that's exactly what You know, is. this is why facts are important, because very quickly the fa- inaccuracies pass down the generations. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's quite moving, isn't it? That is a sobering little piece of mm, documentary mm, there. Mm, Thank you very much for bringing right. it to our attention. Pleasure. Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. It's just uh, exactly 10.30 and it's time for the news. That's MGMT with kids. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Have you seen the video for that? They just finished a video. It's taken them about the nine months. The scary one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that a little while ago, actually. The, the weird, the, the baby being traumatised by right. the monster. It's a pretty unsettling video. Yeah, it's very odd. And most of the comments underneath it on YouTube were, who, how could the mother of that child expose her kid to such hideous... Because basically it's a... Uh, these freaky cartoony monsters but they're done with weird rubbery freaky masks yeah and they're sort of tormenting a little baby in a cradle and the baby appears to be bursting into tears yeah and then the mum picks up the baby and walks down the street a mum played by joanna newsome and all the people they pass in the street are all hideous mutated freaky monsters and the kid's still bawling it's kind of odd we showed it at bug the other day what the... kind of a response did it get well it sort of the audience was laughing um, mm. and uh they sort of found it funny but it was an uncomfortable laughter and a lot of people came up to me afterwards and said they found it uh, irresponsible no sort of an un- un- unpleasant view mm-hmm. i mean the director ray tintori insists that the child was not traumatized i'm sure they took great care yeah, yeah. but uh, still it's worth a look anyway see what you think uh, listeners get in on the debate and then contact us here at the show and uh, let off some steam that's what it's all about okay let's get into text the nation right now here's the jingle Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. His text the nation listeners this week is all about uh cinema rules you know we're putting together a cinema manifesto that we're going to issue to all uh major cinemas in the british isles and if they don't obey it then black squadron are going to perform a top secret operation to bring them down i thought you were going to say perform a topless ballet well, they might do that as well. That would be nice. That's just for us, though. <laughs> so what kind of stuff have we got coming in? We've got some very good ideas coming in uh, from the listeners, Adam. Yeah, okay. I'll read some out to you right now. Why don't you do that, John? Okay, be great. go. Now, go. Uh, here's one from Paul Gledhill in Maidenhead. He says, all popcorn should be pre-crushed or chewed so as not to be so loud that is not practical paul come on it's good so you'd order popcorn and then the guy behind the counter yeah he, two pounds fifty please and then he'd eat it he'd chew it up and feed it and to you like regurg- a bird yeah then we no regurgitate it back into uh yeah. like a, a paper tub like a bird feed- feeding its little chicks i mean that would it would take time and it would be physically revolting like jim carrey and it would render the popcorn inedible yeah but it would reduce the crunching noise in the auditorium. It seems like a fairly extreme thing to do just to... Well, it's being considered for the manifesto. Here's the thing. Here's the problem I foresee, right? And this... Tell me if this is um, being too too niggly. I don't think most people would like to have popcorn, to eat popcorn that's already been eaten and regurgitated by a guy. Well, they're disease-free. It's okay. They'd be checked for disease. Oh, would they? The stuff before, yeah. They'd be medically clean, so it's fine. That's fine. That's a good idea. Good idea. Here's another one from Matt in Lancaster. Cinemas should not show adverts that are also on TV. Uh uh-huh. this is a good, that's a good idea, don't you think? Yes. This is for the single reason that people still laugh at the inanity, consequently ruining the experience for everyone. I think it diminishes the cinema going experience anyway, because it, somewhere in the back of your head, it reduces the, the grand, wonderful dream portal mm-hmm. that is the cinema screen into the, se- to, to the same, drags it down to the same level as the telly. Yes, exactly. No, it's nice to have a unique cinema going experience mm. to see ads there that you d- wouldn't see anywhere. So else. that's a good rule. That's definitely a good candidate for the manifesto. Here's another very good one from Gary Chamberlain. Cinemas should have headphone sockets in the seats like they have on airlines. Mm. I can never understand why they've never done this. It can't be that expensive. It beats listening to some cretinous 15-year-old on his phone or someone behind you guzzling nachos at deafening volume. It probably is that expensive, though, wouldn't you think? It's just a, a couple of little wires. Yeah, but yeah, that would be expensive. I'll do it. 
Really? You go around and fit them all? I mean, it's a brilliant idea. It's a good idea. You have the little quarter inch yes. jack socket there. Yes. Is it quarter inch? I'm not sure. Anyway, and so you can plug, you can just bring in your own yeah, headphones. Yeah. Surround sound you headphones have to as well. Higher headphones or buy them or anything like that. You can just plug them in. Because if 3D takes off, everyone, you know, people might have their own glasses. Mm. They're talking about doing that. You'll buy your, you know, some Ray Ban 3D specs. Right. Uh, so why not go the whole hog and have, uh, have the headphones as well? You could have them built into the glasses, right? Yeah. Could you go quarter hog? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. All right. Um, here's one. I'm trying to find a really good one. A bomb, pop, bomb. That's Joe bom, Filling, bom. listeners. A bom, 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 I should have filled for him, but I just wanted to listen. Got it now. I'm there now. This is from to Tom in up. Loughborough. A bomb, pop, bomb. <laughs> that's just a bit for free. Uh, hi, Dr. Buckles and Mr. Cornballs. When the film is on, the cinema should be engulfed in utter darkness. The only light in the room should be from the projector. A lot of multiplexes leave the lights on these days, and I don't like having my film experience ruined when I accidentally look down and catch a glimpse of my stupid legs and knees. That's true. And, you know, that's one thing that's very different when you go abroad and uh, when you're on the continent and in the States. They they plunge you into total darkness. They've got much hairier knees as well, so they're less light reflective. Exactly, and you can get up to all sorts of different things in the cinema. There. It's true. It's health. It's health and safety, Mad Britain. It absolutely isn't it. Is, darkness isn't it? is illegal, right? It's illegal to, to for it to be dark. It's nice. I like it to be so dark that you stumble around, you break a few people's feet, and yes. stuff like that. Press your hands into their faces, and definitely. And sometimes, if you're unlucky enough to get sat right underneath the very one of the very bright lights there or an exit sign emergency exit yes. sign sometimes they give out more light than the sun oh, disgusting one more last one yeah this is from dave and mike this has taken two brains to <laughs> concoct uh hi adam and joe seats should be magnetized to stop people going to the toilet more than once <laughs> and to stop people leaving five minutes from the end well each i haven't finished yet uh -huh. each seat should have a noise sensor and if someone makes too much noise, an electric shock is delivered. We like your thinking, Dave and Mike. It's well, the kind of thing we like. It's I a like. little bit woolly, though, isn't it? Well, flesh isn't magnetic. Well, that's the thing. So how would you actually... Unless you insert metal plates in people's butock <laughs> <laughs> As they head to the cinema. Yeah, make them eat like a lead snack. That would be doable, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know I, mean, I think insert them into the butocks. An iron snack. I mean, there's no nerve endings there, are there? Just an incision at the top of each wouldn't buttock, it be slip better in the plate. To avoid slipping plates into people's <laughs> bottom Stitch area. Stitch it up. Wouldn't it be better just to have little wee-wee uh, -wee bags on the seats? Um, no, it wouldn't be better. Come better. on. I mean, you, you know bladder capacity is related to height. Is it? I read that the other day. No, you know Yes, so shorter people have smaller bladders. Is that true? Yeah. It certainly applies to me, yeah. So maybe smaller people should go towards the back. Cut a little wee bag. What's wrong with a wee bag? Well, what do you do with it after? People in the cinema, because it's dark, people think they have carte blanche <laughs> to drop things on the floor. I mean, it would be bad if you got it confused with your Pepsi. If, yeah, they dropped it on the floor, then the other bloke gets up to go to the loo and steps on it and it bursts. Well, you somehow build it into the seat... Right. You know I mean? then well, why not go cube. the whole Bunwellian hog and just have lavvy seats? Where's it with you and hogs? <laughs> <laughs> I'm crazy about I'm hogs. Go all the way over all My these. My favourite film is Wild Hogs. <laughs> We're going to come back and hear some more of your suggestions. Keep them coming in. Six four zero four six is the text number. Adam and Joe dot six music at bbc dot co dot uk is the email. Here's a Mercury Prize nominated artist right now. This is Speech to Bell with Spinning. That's the Mercury Prize nominated Speech to Bell with her single Spinning. And full coverage of the Mercury Prize Award starts at 7pm on Tuesday night here on BBC Six Music with Guy Garvey and Elbow talking about winning the prize last year. What kind of things do you think he might say, Adam? When we won the prize, I was so pleased. I did not expect the prize. Then I got it, I got it, and I ate it. It was nice. Now, will I get another one? And Steve Lamax live at the presentation, talking to the nominees and bringing you the announcement of the winner live. Uh, I'm not Steve gonna ask Lamax, you what that's going to sound like. No. He'll actually be hanging from the roof <laughs> of the venue, and he will be drinking the blood of many of the nominees that night. <laughs> the audience will be covered in Lamac droppings. <laughs> what are they call what? What are bat droppings called? Guano. That's right, guano. What are Lamac droppings called? Uh, guano bats. No. Oh, I don't know. Oh, dear. Uh, now, listen, folks, you're listening to Adam and Joe here on BBC I've Six I've got a Six thing music. to uh, talk to you about. I'm, I know I was handing you over. I okay, was doing go. A sorry, do it, do it, do it. <sighs> Here's Joe. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So what um, do you find, Adam Buxton, yeah. any adverts 
Uh, do you find the music on any adverts on telly so annoying that you have to switch them off? There used to be one um, ages ago, a few years back, for some kind of flu remedy that had screaming in the middle. Yes, we talked about that on this show, I think. I remember, it was yeah. really weird. It was just someone going, ah, ah, halfway here's, through the song. Here's my two least favourite bits of advert music. Uh-huh. Um, the first one is, uh, can we play that one, Eliza's Dream? Uh, do you recognise this music? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't this drive you nuts? It does. Would you want this woman doing your banking? <laughs> no, everything about it makes me want to hurt the woman. And then it's accompanied by sort of really teeth-edgy kind of animation. Somehow yes. they've made the animation as sort of creepy as the music. Well, they're going for the quirk factor, aren't they? But they've got they've they've done overquirk, and um, it's very annoying. They've overquirked it. Okay, what about what what about this? Who is uh, that by? Do you know who that's by? It's by some sort of proper composer. Yeah. It's a proper song that probably is quite meaningful and nice. That's now been ruined mm-hmm, by the dirty ad man. by the dirty bank man. But here's another uh, amazing song that's been ruined by the dirty ad men. Do you like it when this song starts? <laughs> <laughs> Don't play the whole flipping thing. <laughs> no, I've though. cut it out before the cell. Oh my goodness. I've got me crunch. Is that still for the same product, the yeah. yogurt corner thing? Yeah, the fruity yogurt tray. I mean, it's a nightmare, isn't it? The original Nina Simone track is uh, not... Oh, well, I'm going to play it in a second. Are you? Yeah, I hadn't really heard the original Are you original playing Nina the one Simone where she track? talks about her boobies? No, it's a live version. And right. it's, it actually only... It's, it's, I think, two songs from the musical Hair uh-huh. stuck together her song but it's a proper moving emotional song about civil rights and about racial repression Mm -hmm. and when it bursts into that sort of joyful chorus at the end it's only after a lot of quite you know dark and meaningful stuff yes and uh i think it's being you know marginally trivialized yeah but there's a great tradition of that people happening i heard uh the other day on what was it on Moyles' show, in fact, mm. they were playing Perfect Day. So here's Perfect Day by Lou Reed. But it wasn't the original version. It was that monstrous version they had a few mm. years back with everyone taking one line, like Bonio. What was that in aid of? I can't remember. It was, was just that a an, BBC promotion? It was just an ad for the BBC, BBC trail. One. Yeah, and they played the whole track. I'm glad I spent it with you. Do you remember that? Leslie Garrett there. And uh, who's it? Six Music's very own um, fun-loving criminal Huey's on there as well. I felt like someone else, someone good, yeah. That's disgraceful. All that stuff. And uh, and that was, I mean, at the time it was bizarre that the BBC was using that song, which is about uh, being a heroin addict, uh, as a promotion for the whole Big British Castle. Mm. It seemed bizarre. Mm. Do you know um, Nina Simone's coming back? Big comeback. You see? From yeah. The, from the grave? Yeah, <laughs> because Al Pacino has resurrected her digitally and she's going to be called Nina Sim One. Nice. That's a very obscure <laughs> joke. <laughs> anyway, look, I thought I'd play that record so you could hear what it's like properly. And, and the same happens when you listen to this. It's brilliant up until the uh, fruity yogurt snack moment when you can't help yeah. but envisage middle-aged housewives doing cartwheels in fields. Right. Uh, but here it is. This is from 1968. This is Nina Simone with I Got Life. Ian Brown with Stellify. I didn't listen properly to that track, but what is to Stellify? What, uh, I don't. It's to make something stellar. I, you know what? I was li- reading text the nations as well. I wasn't really paying attention either. Both of us were not properly not paying really attention. At least we're the, honest about to it. To the Ian Brown track yeah. there. Sorry about that. Listeners. Can we just move on? Do we have to define stellify? What if we just listen? This is a just a suggestion that yeah. we just ignore it and just carry on. I see what you mean. Mm. Okay, fair enough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ro- run with that. Yeah. Actually, I was thinking of rolling with it, but then I thought I'd mm, run. Don't with roll it. with it. No, I'm gonna run with it. Um, instead. Here's a track that I tried to play last week as a free play, right, listeners? But the CD got stuck. And it's from an album by Wild Beasts. They hail from Kendall.
I believe. And their album, Two Dancers, which has just come out, is really, really good. Do you remember I described it as a widescreen sound? I actually got that phrase from the PR notes <laughs> that came with the, with the album. But actually, it was one of the few times when those uh, notes, which are usually pretty ludicrous, was actually right on the money. It's a great album, and I hope you enjoy this track, which is a weird combination of sounds. His voice is very obviously like Billy McKenzie from the associates but then they've also got that kind of uh stellified very bright stellified guitar sound mm. that you would associate with you too or something i mm. don't know it's a good mix though hope you like this this is we still got the taste dancing on our tongues by wild beasts that's good stuff man <laughs> Is that by the Lloyds Bank lady? Could be, couldn't it? It's good. I liked it. That was Wild Beasts with We Still Got the Taste Dancing on Our Tongues from their album Two Dancers. This is Adam and Joe here at BBC Six Music. A great pleasure to be here with you this Saturday afternoon. It's just a little time check for you. It's just gone. Uh, it's just coming up to six minutes past 11 here in London town. Beautiful sunny day outside. Don't know what you got planned. Uh, you might like to give us a call. Let us know what you got planned Gordon for the Brown, weekend. can we still trust him? Why can't he be straight with the country? Alistair Darling, can Britain really spend its way out of recession? And uh, the Millennium Dome. Is it a big white elephant? <laughs> or not? Give us a call. Let us know what you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's pathetic. Okay. Um, made up jokes time, made right? Up jokes, yeah, let's have the jingle. I'm a funny person. I often make up jokes. My jokes are more amusing than those of other folks. When you hear my joke, I think you'll find that you agree. Come on, you're all invited to a made-up joke party. Yeah, made-up jokes, listeners, is the part of the show where we ask you to send us your made-up jokes. It couldn't be simpler, really, but they do have to be made up. They have to be things you've invented. They can't be jokes you heard a long time ago and now think you made up. They've got to be really creative and created and we have got a bank of experts here at the big british castle that vet all of these jokes apply various stringent algorithms to them mm. and only the made-up ones get through stringent algorithms <laughs> <laughs> i've always wanted to say that here's one from robin in manchester he says my wife wendy has made up this terrible terrible joke so he's palming it off immediately on wendy there wendy uh worst of all she seems really pleased with herself this tends to happen if you make up a joke generally it's a good feeling i whenever i someone says their wife's called wendy i just always picture the husband like lolloping around the house with an axe oh wendy, wendy. <laughs> i thought you were gonna say <laughs> like poor wendy looking really timid and frightened in a corner i thought you were gonna say you hear that she's called wendy and you picture the husband flying around in green tights yes like peter pan no i don't <laughs> <laughs> that's what i picture anyway here's wendy's joke uh this is about uh, she basically says it's not even in the form of like a joke good good a promiscuous bird keeps singing frank sinatra songs Oh, dear. Egrets, I've had a few. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so our beautiful assistant, Xanthi, is putting her head in, head in her hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite She is chuckling. Good job, Wendy. Have you got one there, Joe? Yeah, I've got one here from Jim in Chesterfield. <sighs> the other week, a Native American friend of mine ran out of coffee filters and was forced to use his shoe to brew up. Upon hearing this, the local beverage-loving lo priest described it as a moccasin. Moccasin. A moccasin. <laughs> I like the fact that it's... He has to wangle in the fact that he's the beverage-loving priest. Yeah, yeah, that's good. The more, the more unbalanced they are, the better. <laughs> that's good, Jim. A moccasin. You know, nobody laughed. No. This is not that good. Well, no, it is good because but we it's were... It's a good effort. ...happy. It made us happy. It did make us happy. It and sometimes happiness depressed. is about more than mere... Just laughing. Laughter. Yeah. Here's one from... Uh, oh, who's this from? This is anonymous. Well, you'll understand why when you hear it. My made-up joke goes like this. So I hear Amy... W I like the conversational ones. Yeah. Yes. So, so um, I hear Amy Winehouse has cancelled her tour of Saudi Arabia. Oh, God. Oh, yeah? Yeah. They tried to make her go to Riyadh, but she said, no, no, no. Oh, that's from Joe, it says at the end. Oh. There. Not you, Joe. No. They tried to make her go to Riyadh. That's good. That's good, isn't it? Because it sounds a bit like Riyadh. A little bit like it. Tiny bit like it. <laughs> Here's one from Adam in Saffron Walden. What do you call a heavy metal band 
that has to really meticulously set up their instruments and make sure everything is neat and tidy on stage. OCDC. That's good. Is that made up? That's too good, maybe. That's too good. Is that too good? OCDC. If you've got... Have you got more? I've got one, one more. more. Check this out, all right? This is from Sean Curtis. A group of chess players were standing in the lobby discussing their recent tournament victories. After about an hour, the manager came out of the office and asked them to disperse. But why? they asked as they moved off. Because, said the manager, I can't stand chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. That's good. <laughs> that is very good. That is good, Sean Curtis. We should have saved that one for Crinklemas. I mean, that's amazing. Ooh, brilliant. We can, we can haul that one out at Christmas again. Oh, People brilliant. would have forgotten. If you've got a made-up joke, and you have to have thought of it yourself, and the way to make that clear is for the joke to be really pretty awful and tortured, <laughs> <laughs> but for there to be some structural thing happening in it. Because I can't stand chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. <laughs> it's not in most joke books that you're going to open. <laughs> <laughs> then send your joke to adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk and every single joke we read out will win nothing. Will win absolutely nothing, but it will save the life of a fairy. Here's the Zootons with Valerie. We've got some good made-up jokes coming in already on the text, but a lot of people are complaining there that the chess one is not a made-up joke, it's an oldie, and we do rely on our listeners to out liars. What? I don't believe that's an oldie. Three or four people have texted in and say it's... One person says it's been on TV before. <gasps> it's a fairly famous one that's even been on TV. Chestnuts boasting yeah. in an open foyer. Yes. Sean Curtis, get in touch, for goodness sake, de defend your good name. I mean, maybe if we did find, you know, if we prove that someone had deliberately lied, then we could get them into the studio and get some Black Squadron members in and have a live punishment. Tickle. A tickle. I mean, tickling can be dangerous. Wow. We'll have to check the cost. We've already rules. established that if Black Squadron tickle you, it could be deadly. Well, they're above the law. Exactly. They can they tickle can do you what they want. on the NFI, ATL. on the Butox. Mm. But what if there was some people from the cinema we were talking about earlier that had steel plates in their butox? Then they wouldn't be, be sensitive to the tickling. They would be immune from the tickling. Yeah. Anyway, we can deal with this later on. Uh, but yeah, keep your jokes coming in, especially through the week. You know, if you're listening to the podcast as well and you want to keep some coming in there, then uh, make sure you do so. That was pretty <laughs> slick, wasn't it? Um, now, I've been reading uh, a book by Roald Dahl to my children recently. And, you know, Roald Dahl continues to be a favourite author for children all over the world. Well done, Roald. Did you like uh, Roald, Ronald, as I used to call him? Yeah, I used to love uh, Ronald. Did you ever read Danny Champion of the World? That's one I never read, no. Well, it was one that was always talked about by my contemporaries at school, and I never read it myself when mm. I was growing mm. up. But I remembered uh, our friend Mark particularly saying how much he loved it, and I thought, oh, yeah, I should read that. I should get that for the boys. And it's it's sort of oddly dated because it's about a father and son who are involved with poaching pheasants, right, mm. one way or another, and they, and they kind of gang up against this nasty local landowner and uh, teach him a lesson by doing some poaching shenanigans. But the backbone of the story is the relationship between the I'm father... I'm seeing Mel Smith. Uh, ...as the local landowner. Yeah. Well, there was a film adaptation of it... With, with, with an actor and his son, was it? In, I think Jeremy Irons was in and, one film adaptation. Yeah, and his, and his real son played Danny, didn't he? Possibly. Anyway, uh, I haven't seen the film, but in the book, uh, the relationship between the father and the son is absolutely key. And it's, an, a, it's a sort of utopian depiction of what that relationship might be. Mm. So as a father reading this to your sons, mm. you're forced to feel a little bit like you're coming up short as a father when you're reading it, right? Well, why? What kind of things is, is, is Roald saying? Well, just the things that... I mean, the, the extent to which the son idolises his father, because the book is told from the point of view of Danny, the mm. son, right? And he just talks non-stop about how perfect his father yes. is the whole time. And the mother is dead in the book, so it's just him and his dad living so in this caravan. So she's off the hook. She's off the hook, no problem. It's all on the dad. And he's they just live in this caravan. They don't have a TV or anything, no sort of serious mod cons. They just live this life totally disconnected from DSs and tellies and all those other things. Well, it was written probably in the 70s, it, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, so they just make up their own entertainment, and every day is a wonderful uh, roller coaster ride of uh, of wonder and uh, fantastical things, thanks to Danny's dad. And as I was reading it, like I was, I was sort of embarrassed reading it to my son because it, 
I fell so far short of, of this ideal that had been set up by Roald Dahl. So what I've done is I've, um, I'm going to read you like a paragraph from the book, a real paragraph from Danny Champion of the World. And then you have to see, uh, where I've slightly added the reality of my own fatherhood onto the end. Mm. Okay. So here's a bit from Danny Champion of the World by Roald Dahl. I really loved those morning walks to school with my father. We talked practically the whole time. Mostly, it was just he who talked and I who listened, and just about everything he said was fascinating. He was a true countryman. The fields, the streams, the woods, and all the creatures who lived in these places were a part of his life. Although he was a mechanic by trade, and a very fine one, I believe he could have become a great naturalist if only he had had good schooling. Long ago he had taught me the names of all the trees and the wild flowers, and all the grasses that grow in the fields, all the birds too, I could name, not only by sighting them, but by listening to their calls and their songs. Then one day my father was arrested for poaching and was placed in the care of a short I was placed in the care of a short stocky man with a beard who insisted I call him either Buckules or Dr Buckles although he was not really a doctor he said that he didn't have time to walk me to school because he was working on important jingles and from now on he would drive me instead I tried to ask him the names of the trees and plants we passed as we drove but he couldn't tell me what a single one was called often he was unsure which were actually trees I asked him what kind of engine his car had, and he said he thought the car took diesel and that it was silver, but that was it. I asked him about politics, and he started mumbling about everything being Al Gore's fault. After a few days, the conversation ran out altogether, and we sat in silence on the trips to school. Then one morning, he emerged from the house brandishing a shiny disc, which he thrust into the car's CD player. He turned to me and said, I've made us a simply marvellous compilation to listen to in the car, Danny. There's some B-sides by Dirty Shirty and the Buggernauts, and there's a few live tracks by Jimmy Big Nuts, Pointy Pinga, and Jihadaway. I think this is going to be the most wonderful trip to school you've ever taken. I opened the car door and ran and ran, and I didn't stop running until I was far, far away. Could you tell where the real story changed and where i came in there no no it, <laughs> it was so the transition was so smooth you wait till you're a father and you read danny champion of the world you will feel a little bit on the guilty side i can guarantee it's uh it's dramatic opposites though isn't it because the he's a poacher he's a criminal mm -hmm. so but, but but he's a brilliant lovely criminal he's a noble criminal so that works well dramatically but whereas you are a lazy <laughs> father who doesn't care as much about his no i have to word this carefully yeah you but do you present yourself as a lazy father who's more interested in his own concerns you know the thing that worried me those are the children the thing that worried me most was the fact that i the, the the names of the trees and the birds and stuff like that you know so what would work for you is if you didn't have kids and then you were shouldered with some relatives kids you right. know that would then be a good thing and you were forced to learn about parenthood yeah but why can't the children be interested in einster's and neubarten and stuff like that i could tell them all sorts of things about that's that. what kids are for <laughs> <laughs> to destroy you to kill you yeah there you go here's some music right now this is mia with paper plane that's the beatles with sh she said she said and uh, there's a big week of all Beatles stuff on telly, isn't there, coming up? Yeah, because they are re-releasing, probably not for the last time. Every time they re-release the Beatles back catalogue, you think, surely that's it. But nah, they always find some new way of re-releasing the whole lot and getting excited about it. Uh, and I'm excited about it because they always do find new little nuggets. I mean, it won't be the same when all four of the Beatles are finally no longer with us, you know? it'll That sad day will come. When they crash into the Eiffel Tower. When they crash into the Eiffel Tower, or, or they get in a car with a murderer. Um, something like that. But, you know, it's still interesting reading the interviews with Paul McCartney and stuff that are around, and he's talking about, you know, John Lennon not actually being so uh, grumpy as he's made out to be and so acerbic. Some people are sort of saying, well, John Lennon, you know, he used to really slag off Paul McCartney. Um, and, and Paul says, no, 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 he, we, we got on very well. It was just the way he was. He would be fast and loose and, and say crazy, um, Noel Gallagher style things yeah. or Liam Gallagher style things. And actually he was a lot. Lennon's softer. overrated anyway. He couldn't, uh, record an album like Pipes of Peace if he tried. That's right. And he'd be lost with a frog chorus. <laughs> he wouldn't know what to do with him. <laughs> he'd be absolutely lost. <laughs> uh, this is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Coming up to our last half hour here this Saturday morning. It's 11.30 and it's time for the news.
Mystery Jets, uh, now that's not called Two Doors Down, is it? Is. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? I think I'm in love with a girl who lives two doors down. That's what oh, they were singing. Then. There you go. Well, then it is. It is called Two Doors Down. This is Adam and Joe on BBC Six Music. Now, we were asking for made-up jokes and we were sent one to do with a chess convention. Sean Curtis sent this in. Group of chess players standing in the lobby discussing their recent tournament victories. After an hour, the manager comes out of the office and asks them to disperse. Why, they ask? Because, he says, I can't stand chess nuts boasting in an open foyer. I was very, very impressed. And Chris, his name's Chris, right? Sean Curtis. Sean, his name's Chris, right? (laughs) Sean uh, told us that he'd made that up. Well, I don't know. James has clipped the joke out of his email, so we don't have the rest of the email to But have. still, that's a terrible lie, and the rules are very strict here He at might the not have lied, though. He might have just sent it in. He mm. said it was made up. Adam's trying to defend him there. I was. We got a flurry of texts and emails uh, presenting evidence that the joke is, in fact, very old, including this one from Freddy. Fraud, four exclamation marks. 7,650 Google hits for chestnuts boasting in an open foyer. Bring the cheat in for a black squadron tickling. Ooh. So, uh, this week, we are going to try and get in touch with Sean. We're going to arrange for him to be brought to the station in chains. Mm -hmm. And then if all goes according to plan, we will select a Black Squadron member to come into the studio as well. And then either next week or the week after, depending on how long it takes to arrange, or possibly never, depending on the rules, uh, there will be a sort of a public flogging. In the studio, or tickling, not flogging. And does he have to come in change, or can he come in brushes too? Change. <laughs> yeah, no, he has to come in chains. On the chain. Couple of chains. Has to come on the chain. So there we go, because um, we don't put up with that kind of thing here at the Adam and Joe Show. Sean, I can't believe you'd let me down like that, boy. What are you thinking? We got that joke over the summer. So we weren't, we weren't able to properly. Sean is doing. He might, he might not might be listening. Country. He might well have left the country because of. Uh, he it's might have shame. other. He might have other joke fraud charges currently exactly. pending. He might be doing some international Nigerian joke fraud. He's the Ronnie Biggs Pyramid of the scheme. joke world. He's gone off to live in luxury and. Uh, we're going to track him down and we're going to bring him to justice oh for your goodness. benefit, listeners. All right. All right. Uh, now, here's a free play for you, folks. This is the new pornographers. And I like this song because it's... It, I like this song because... I like that. The reason I like this song is because I like it because it is yes. about archaeologists. Time's and up. There are, time's up. There are not many songs up. about archaeologists. Time. And it song. makes me think of Indiana Jones no, and the Temple of cheating. Doom. This is called The Bones of an Idol by the New Pornographers. Love that song. That's The Bones of an Idol by the New Pornographers. Now, we promised last week that we were going to canvas suggestions for a Song Wars subject from you, the listeners. They poured into our blog, and we have made our decision. But shall we tell people what kind of things uh, were suggested? Yeah, we had lots of fantastic suggestions on the blog. Here is, for instance, one that Gary Socrates sent in. He wanted us to do a song about our favourite animal in the zoo in the style of a 70s prog rock band. This could then be developed into a concept album along the lines of pictures of an exhibition, uh, except about monkeys, for instance. That is an idea that we rejected. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was no good. It's insanely complicated. It's good, no, but but, but we didn't think it was no good. We thought it was brilliant, but it was too much for us. Yeah. Here was one from Mike Murr. He says, I think a sea shanty would be great. I've got no specific themes in mind. I'd just love to hear you do a sea shanty, a little accordion, perhaps some seagull noises to complete the scene. Well, I've got a melodica, and that would be good for a sea shanty, I think. I like that suggestion. There were some very good suggestions. Here was one of my favourite ones, even though this didn't make it. Uh, Derek Boland wanted a fantasy face-off. He wanted one of us to play the role of Hoggle from Labyrinth and another to play the role of Dobby from Harry Potter, Dobby the House Elf. And then they would both throw songs insulting their masters. Uh, To quote, he says they would throw insults back and forth about whose master is the bigger ponce. Jareth, the Goblin King from Labyrinth, or Harry <laughs> Potter from Harry Potter. Is he really called Jareth? Jareth. Uh, that, that, that would make sense. What a like terrible a mix name. between Jared and Gareth. Gar- <laughs> <laughs> Jareth. And he wanted that sung in a light opera, Gilbert and Sullivan style. <laughs> I mean, that's a good idea. We might store that one up in the memory box. And is he definitely Hoggle, not Coggle? 
No, you were saying Coggle, I think. What were we saying? We got it wrong. I can't we? remember. It's blended in my mind. We got wrapped on the knuckles before for confusing Hoggle and Coggle. But listen, here is the one we have chosen. And this was sent in by Rufus Blacklock. And he wrote, please, Adam and Joe, I need some bath time songs for oh. when I'm in the bath. Perhaps reggae, like Under the Sea in The Little Mermaid. Uh -huh. Please make them bubbly, splooshy and all watery. Thanks, says Rufus. So that had a simplicity that appeals to Adam and I, even though, do you think we're going to come up with quite similar songs? Probably, yeah. And there's a limited set of experiences <laughs> the in the bath. The bath time songs. Yeah. We should but, play next week, um, as well as our songs, we should play a, a track called Bath Time in Clerkenwell by The Real Tuesday World, which is mm -hmm. very good. It's just instrumental, though. I think we should try and push ourselves uh, away from the more obvious bath references. Or maybe not. Maybe really? just let it, let it, let it. Yeah. Why don't you push yourself away from the obvious? <laughs> and you go for it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I was thinking, because the, the, the big decision is who you are in the bath. Are you going to be just yourself or mm. you could be anyone in the bath? You could be a, a special person having was, a bath. Was, 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 was. A David's having a bath. I'm running the bath and it's bubbling over my bits. A was, a was, a was. Hey, come on. You, we don't play them till next week. Yeah. That, you know, that would do. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that so that's do. what we're going to go with. Sometime between now and next week, we are going to write songs about bath. And yeah, right. we'll be playing those next week if all goes according to plan. Thank you very much, Rufus, and thanks to everyone who puts suggestions on our blog. If you want to visit our blog, it's at bbc.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash Adam and Joe, and it's a reciprocal for all of your relevant waffle. A reciprocal. Yeah. Receptacle? Oh, receptacle, oh God. <laughs> I'm going all Jareth. You're going all Jareth on, <laughs> on the listeners' asses. And don't forget, as well, there is a podcast available of this show, uh, which comes out on a Monday evening, I think. It was, um, yeah, it came out Monday last week, didn't it? Even though it was bank holiday, James. That's the kind of producer we've got here. It was out on here. Sunday last week. Was it? There was a lot of excitement on another non-Castle-sponsored blog, right. adamandjoe.com, which is another very good fan blog. They were very excited that it popped up on sunday top producing james he puts our podcast together uh from highlights so-called highlights from this program and uh, it's a very enjoyable listen if i do say so myself so check it out here's we're gonna some... yeah sorry mate play we're gonna play another record then we'll be back to wrap up text the nation yeah here's the kinks with waterloo sunset that's the kinks there with waterloo sunset this is adam and joe on bbc six music in the last 10 minutes of our show uh, we're gonna wrap up text the nation are we gonna have a bit of a jingle bit of a jingle jungle you haven't got any listener jingles there have you james by any chance sometimes what we do is we get uh, some of our listeners to send in their own versions of some of the jingles we use here on the program and feel free to do that anytime you wish uh james have you got one there yeah here's one that a listener sent in of our text the nation jingle Sorry. Oh, hello. Now, we were sort of getting people to try and copy the jingle as accurately as possible, right? Yeah, do ver their own insane versions thereof. Yeah, yeah, remixes. That kind of thing. Like this, for example. Text the nation, text the nation, what if I don't want to? Text the nation, I've got a music email. Text the nation, text the nation, It's for, it's Oh, there we go. It's because of his regional accent. He's a Geordie. Uh, <laughs> I like it generally when words are sung funny to make them fit a tune. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? Slightly mispronounced to sure, make them yeah. fit a tune. Sunshiai. I did a jingle for this show the other day that I never brought in because I ended up, to fit it into the beat, I ended up saying, uh, singing Adam and Joe on the BBC. Because mm. uh, I said BBC. <laughs> I just thought I can't You're have a jingle that says BBC. I've got some new jingles for the podcast this week that are a tiny bit on the embarrassing side. Are they? Yeah. You have to listen to the podcast so to find that out. That was very good. Who was that by there? That was unusually sincere. And that was not a reworking of our existing jingle, but an entirely new take on the whole yeah. text the nation. Who's the chap what done that? Alex Hatton. Alex. Alex Adam, there you go. Thanks, Alex. Anyway, so Text the Nation this week is all about a cinema manifesto we're putting together. We want your new rules for behaviour and etiquette at cinemas that we're going to impose on all cinemas in the British Isles. Otherwise, they'll be subverted in a way we haven't thought of yet by Black Squadron. So here are some good suggestions. Uh, mm. It was the pirate. Uh, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> the pirate and then the Phil <laughs> in quick succession. <laughs> wow, what a great moment. It's pirate Phil. Uh, uh, Michelle uh, and bum, Ian bum, bum. <laughs> in their conservatory in Rainy Bolton. 
They say the following. People used to clap or cheer when the British Board of Film Classification information came on the screen as it signalled the start of the film. I remember this fondly and still give a quiet little cheer even now. Please make this mandatory in your manifesto. I agree. You the know? whole audience must go... Because I still, I still, when that uh, logo comes up on the screen, I still reach across and, and grab the arm of whoever I'm with and give them a little thumbs up. A free son of excitement. Here we go! <laughs> Hold Potter! tight! Strap yourselves down! <laughs> For two and a half hours of bow Pointless lots. noise. Um, here is another one that comes from Amanda and Liam. They say, Cinema Passport. You get a unique stamp for every film seen, so you have a record. It's a way to show off, plus screen potential friends and outliers. Quite a good idea. You have a passport. When you see a film, they stamp it on the way in. Uh -huh. So you'd end up with a book. Is that the film you see? What was the last one there? Have you seen the film? Have you seen the film? I've got my papa. Can I take off that hat? Oh, I've got my papa. Here's one from Eggman from East Kilbride. Adam and Joe, my input to the manifesto is regarding armrests on seats. Cinemas should provide armrests for each seat rather than some kind of communal one between each seat. This causes unacceptable levels of elbow jostling and awkwardness if you've got a stranger on one side of you. If this is unworkable, then people should only be allowed to rest their elbow on the armrest to their right where the drink holder is failure to comply should be punished with amputation oh dear <laughs> i have a similar thing i was in the cinema the other day and a man came and sat next to me and he put his arm on the same rest as mine and the little hairs on his arm oh. were like daintily touching my arm your bare hairs. arm yeah and it was at once sexy and utterly revolting and did he just leave it there yeah, well, it was kind of like a challenge. It was like a little fairy light challenge oh. along my uh, hairy arm. As soon as I get any stranger flesh contact, I would withdraw it. Withdraw. Well, that's what he wanted me to do. But I thought, oh yeah, that's that's the game you're playing, are you? Yeah. So the way to go is to sort of caress. Back. So the hairs on your <laughs> arm stood up and started intermingling I just with his. Plunged my hand into his inner thigh and started tickling. <laughs> <laughs> and then reached round to the butox, but found they were encased in metal. Yes. Have we got any more? Let's have a look. Um, yes, somebody, Tim in Chelty says, using a seat for coats is all right, but it must be paid for. <laughs> 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 That's just from the cinema manager. Matt in Sheffield says, when a rat runs across your feet, as happened to me in the Leicester Square Odeon, the management are to refund the price of your ticket, not argue with you that it's hard for them with rats because they're so close to the underground. <laughs> <laughs> Good old, uh... That's the square. That used to happen in the Scarlet. Do you remember that? Yeah. You'd have rats in cinema. It's good. Well, they used to have, you know, they used to have a cat in the Scarlet yes. in London's King's Cross that would eat all the rats. And finally, from Ross Smith, there should be a remote control to let you watch another film if the whole audience agrees. Just like in Britain's Got Talent, everyone presses a button when they're <laughs> bored. There's a big cheer when it's the majority. Wow. If that was up to cornballs, you'd be fast forwarding to the good bit, yeah. wouldn't you? What? That's your technique. Is it? When we sit down to watch DVDs sometimes, you're like, oh, this is a boring bit. And you skip to the good Do parts. It. Well, you used to. Maybe you've matured since then. Maybe. Hey, listen, keep your suggestions for our film manifesto coming in on our blog and we'll put the top ten up. Uh, that's it from us this week. Thank you so much for listening. Liz Kershaw's coming up. Right now, here's one final free play. This is yours, Joe. Yeah, this is Michael Jackson, a pop singer that died recently from his recent album, Invincible. This is a remix of a track called Butterflies. Pop we'll see you next week. Died recently. Jeez. Take care, listeners. Bye. Bye.